Okay, guys, welcome back to our channel. For those of the, uh, for wow, those of you, <laughs> great we're start. St we're starting out great. <laughs> for those of you that are new, welcome. For those of you that are returning, thank you so much for coming back. Now, this week we're going to go through somewhat of a roller coaster of a case. It has more ups and downs than the largest roller coaster at Six Flags. So basically, what we're going to be talking about is a sergeant who survived two tours in Afghanistan just to come home to be brutally gunned down on the side of the road while trying to help a stranded motorist. What the fuck, guys? But like, Do what better. would compel? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what would make a random stranger just shoot someone when they're trying to help them? Which is so baffling. But we'll be answering all of these questions and more in this episode. But before we get into it, my name's Natalie. I'm Erica, and this is Drunken True Crime. Doop. Okay, for those of you that are new, we do have a few disclaimers that we're going to go through fast, so listen up. If you are returning, you know these by heart now, probably. But one, we talk about true crime. Two, we drink. Three, we cuss. Four, we laugh because we're typically making fun of each other or the asshats murderers in these stories, but never the victims. So if any of those things offend you, maybe skip this. But if this sounds like a good time to you, grab your cocktail, grab those headphones, and let's dive into this case. Now, this week, we are actually drinking an old fashioned, which is one of my favorite drinks. Um, bartenders make it way better than I do, though. So we'll see if it's good. Hold on. Pretty strong. It's definitely a sipping drink. Yeah. Yes, it is definitely a sipping drink. So, <laughs> so Vincent Gosling Jr. was born on September 23rd, 1983 to Vincent and Rona. Now, he was known as Vince to his friends and family. Wait, wait you didn't say the last name. Please say their last name for me. Rippin Kroger. Kroger. Rippin Kroger. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, so he was known as Vince to friends and family. So from here on out, that's how we're going to refer to him. His childhood, although not bad, did come with its own struggles. His mom did actually leave when he was only eight months old, and he was left to be raised by his father. Now, throughout his childhood, Vince's father would marry over five different times, making it kind of an unstable upbringing, if you could only imagine, right? So Vince would often find stability and solace in his friend's best friend's homes. Now, if you're judging a book by its cover, um, Vince might have looked like a troubled kid. So he had tattoos, piercings, and he was already a father of two to two sons by the age of 18. But on the other side, Vince was very loving and caring and an absolute wonderful father. Like those kids were his absolute life. Now, he then met a girl named Jessie Hall, who he just fell like head over heels in love with her. And her family kind of took Vince in and treated him as one of their own. Now, Vince actually became quite close with Jesse's dad, who was a retired military guy. So this actually inspired Vince to join as well. So in February of 2005, Vince made the big decision to join the Army at the age of 21. So this was a kick in the butt to Vince needed to get his life back on pace. Shortly after joining the military, Vince got down on one knee and proposed to Jesse. Now, despite having a tumultuous relationship, the two were ecstatic and wasting no time jumping into married life. Then, not long after getting married, the two quickly started having children. They ended up having two girls and one boy, now making Vince a father of five. Vince's job in the army required him to travel a lot and go on multiple tours in the Middle East. If you are or know anyone that is in a military marriage, you know how hard that can be and how it can take a toll on the whole family. However, Vince and Jesse seemed to make it work somehow. Jesse took control on the home front and Vince protected our country on the front lines. In 2008, the couple moved to Kentucky where Vince was stationed in Fort Campbell. The couple settled into their routine in their new life in Kentucky, or as my husband likes to say, Kentucky. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> he has the best, like, Dunna. Dunna. Like, I say that all the time. Now. Like, Dunna. For he DNA. Says that, he like, says jalapeno it. instead of jalapeno. Yeah, I did know that one. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I know several others, but I can't think of them off the top of my head, but they'll yeah. come to me as, I mean, I Kentucky. Like, yeah, every, like, couple has those, like, weird, like, David doesn't say dinner, he says din, din Like, what are we doing for din, din I literally just texted Mark, and I was like, what is for din, din? Oh, my God. <laughs> 
<laughs> buried my best friend. <laughs> in early 2012, Vince had just returned home safely from his second tour in Afghanistan on Friday, February 13th. Right before Valentine's Day. I know. But they had a lot of sex. The couple went out on a date to celebrate Vince's safe return home. So after the date, on their way back to the house, uh, the couple would run into trouble that would change their life forever. Now, as they were driving down the road, they noticed a stranded motorist on the side. So Vince decided to pull over to see if the person needed help. Now, Vince gets out of the car and walks over over to the person to see, you know, what he can do. Now, Jessie says she then heard a gunshot and saw Vince fall to the ground. Vince uses all of the strength that he has to get back to Jesse into the car. Vince tried to climb into the car, but the man kept pulling him back. He finally just screamed at Jesse to drive away so that she would be safe. Begrudgingly, Jesse does as she's told and speeds off. When she's at a safe distance, she pulls over on the side of the road and calls 911. Oh, I just sat on the side of the road and my husband got out to see if some guy needed help. Listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. I can't understand a word you're saying. You're going to have to calm down and talk to me. My husband tried getting in the vehicle. He couldn't get in the vehicle. He screamed for me to go. Oh, I don't know where to get in the water. So, rightfully so, Jesse is obviously hysterical. I mean, how would you not be? And now we only have snippets of the 911 tape, but we do hear Jesse explain to the operator what happened to her husband, right? So now around the same time, another 911 call comes in from another man who also heard these gunshots. He then drove over to where Vince was and saw him laying on the ground, dead from the gunshot wound. Now, as this witness was driving toward Vince, he spotted a truck, a white truck, speed off in the opposite direction. So, following these 911 calls, police are immediately dispatched to the crime scene, obviously. When they arrive, they find Vince laying on the ground in his own blood with a gunshot wound to his head and his face. And it would actually later come out during the autopsy that Vince had been shot nine times. Wow. I know. So, about a quarter of a mile down the road, police find Jesse sobbing and seemingly in shock, which, I mean, who the fuck would it be? She literally just fucking saw her husband gunned down in the middle of the street. Like, I mean, seriously, how fucking traumatic. I can't even imagine. So despite this, though, police know they have to interview Jessie right away. She's an eyewitness of the crime, and any information that she was able to give them would help them. Right. Because, you know, we all know the first 48 hours in any investigation is absolutely crucial. So detectives bring Jessie back to the station to interview her. During the interview, she told investigators that the man who shot her husband was black, but she wasn't able to give more, much more detail than that, so didn't really give police much to go on. They then asked her what the vehicle the man was driving, which she describes as a sedan that was reddish, brownish color. Now remember, the eyewitness who saw the man speed off was in a white truck, so very different than what Jesse saw. Yeah, so the man who, like the eyewitness, the eyewitness yeah, said the, saw the white truck yeah, speeding instead away. of a reddish brownish color. Exactly. Instead of a sedan. Yeah. So very different from what Jesse saw. So right off the bat, this leaves the investigators confused and going in different directions. Random attacks are some of the hardest to solve, at, and this didn't even give them much to go on. Right. I think I already have a theory. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. I will. (laughs) They didn't want to push Jessie too far since she was still in shock and grieving the death of her husband. So they ended the interview with her but continued the investigation. So the next morning, detectives, they start to canvas the neighborhood and they're talking to neighbors about Vince. One of the neighbors actually ends up telling them like a really troubling story. So he tells them that Vince had gotten himself into some trouble with a local drug dealer over meth. Now, the story of, like, what happened is kind of confusing, but what I could piece together from investigating, it or investigating, who am I, from researching? Detective Natalie on the case. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> from researching, um, is that Vince somehow got into trouble with these drug dealers. Either he, like, stole from them or he purchased meth from them and, like, without being able to pay in full, and he just never ended up paying them, something of that nature. But he was basically in about $20,000 worth of debt to these drug dealers. So, again, this is what the neighbor told police. Now, police know that in small towns, the rumor mill is large and it is fast. So they were questioning the neighbors a little bit more. So they were like, okay, but where did you hear this? And they actually told police that they heard it directly from um, Jessie herself just a few weeks earlier. 
Yeah. So now this is obviously interesting to police. And this is this is a lead that they can work with. This gives them something to go off of. Now, at this point, military police are involved with the investigation as well. Jesse's friend urged her to sit down and talk to the military police about that night. At this point, she has calmed down. It's been a few days, and so they think that she can probably be more of a help. Jesse agrees and goes down to the office for an interview. She tells military police that on their way home from dinner, she was driving and she became sick to her stomach. Vince told her to turn down the road so that she could pull over and throw up. This is where they ran into a stranded motorist and Vince got out of the car to help. Jesse then reports that she heard multiple gunshots and then saw Vince come to the passenger side of the car and was trying to climb inside the passenger seat. But the guy came up behind him and pulled Vince out of the car. This is when Vince screamed her at her to drive off and she did as she was told. Jesse then told police about the drug dealer that Vince was in trouble with, stating that Vince told her that they were, quote, in debt to some very bad people. Just like the local police, when the military police heard this, they perked up. This was a strong motive for someone to kill Vince, and this is a lead that they can go on. I didn't mess up once. That was really good. And I, there were so many typos in my script, guys. I did not mess up once. I know, once. and she like somehow skipped through all of them. It was really impressive. Good job. <laughs> Class, Class <laughs> um, So police start investigating the drug angle, but... We're also continuing their canvassing and investigation of any other possible suspects. They were also trying desperately to find the truck that fled from the screen, also known as scene. Um, While canvassing the neighborhood, police spoke with several neighbors that reported seeing a white truck matching the eyewitness's description actually parked at Vince and Jesse's house many times. Oh, shit. Right? They were able to track down the truck to a Jared Long, a former soldier stationed at Fort Campbell. Now at th- oh, yes. I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it to yourself. Now, at this point, they put a bowler, be on the lookout for Jared Long, and they do eventually find him in Colorado, but they were unable to hold him due to lack of evidence. They All they had was this car that looked like that fled from the scene. Right. <clears throat> now, during this time, they also bring Jesse back in for another interview just to make sure that they got all the information about that night correct and if she knew anything about Jared Long. This is when Jesse told police that she hadn't told them everything about that night. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. She goes on to say that the real reason she turned down that road that night was because she had received a text message from the drug dealers that were after them. The text said that he would kill her entire family if she didn't follow his exact instructions. The text told her to turn down that specific road. Jesse complied and did as she was told. So Vince didn't tell her, tell her to turn on that road. No. These drug dealers. But I thought Vince was in depth. With right. these drug dealers. But the, according to Jesse, these drug dealers were going after the entire family. But as you're, as exactly what Eric is picking up on, there's some real inconsistencies. And when anyone starts changing a story like that in a criminal like investigation. Like how would the drug dealers like know how to, what her phone number was? Because they were going after the entire family. I but guess. that's some like deep digging you'd have to do. Exactly. Exactly. And as we see, it just. It, the story gets worse from here. So, like I just questioned Natalie, this seemed <laughs> odd to the police that Jesse would lie about this when first interviewed. So, they continued to press her. When asked about why Jared's truck was seen parked in the driveway multiple times, Jesse, Jesse finally admitted to knowing Jared, but said that they were just friends. Just friends. Just friends. Right. During this time when canvassing and talking to neighbors, police discovered that when Vince was deployed, Jared's truck was seen at Jesse's house about two to three times a week. You homewrecker. Yes. <laughs> they then discovered that when Vince was deployed, Jared, I almost called him Jerry, Jared basically lived at Jesse's house. And when Vince would return, Jared would leave. They even found a car registered in both of their names. That's right. These two asshats shared a car together. Literally, Jesse and Jared shared a car. J and J. Literally, they're on the registration is both of their names, and they thought that this wouldn't come up in this investigation. <laughs> you dumb shits. Dumb. Thank God. But like, true. Anywho, this is obviously the biggest bombshell for the police. This took Jesse from a sad mourning widow to a sketchy, cheating ass wife. Yeah. To do that to a husband that's like deployed is some sort, like, it deserves some layer in hell. Well, like, and as we like unwrap, we'll talk about it more. Cheating end, is like, bad in general, but at the same time, like. But like, just what, what, 
just besides the tree, like all of it together is just like, what the fuck? Like right. there's other options. I don't know. It just, uh, I fucking, I, I, cheating gets underneath my skin anyways, but like, we'll go on with the story and then we'll get into it. <laughs> so police. I'm about to blow up. <laughs> so police turn up the heat, just like it's turning up the heat with Natalie yeah. while interviewing Jesse. Feisty. They are done with her shit and all of her lying. They confront her with the fact that they know it wasn't a black man there that night, which fuck you, Jesse, for just. She's all types of racist, turd. bigot, cheating, cheating, whore, liar, liar, asshole, sinner, C word. You need Jesus so much. So many things do you need? So they confront her with the fact that they know it wasn't a black man there that night and that it was, in fact, Jared's car and they knew about the affair. So now at this point, Jesse is obviously backed into a corner. So you think she would just admit to it, right? She, they obviously know what's going on. The police do. But no, no, Margot. She continues to deny it, um, saying that Jared and her were just friends. But then... Just a few hours later, after being interrogated for a little bit longer, she then says that they may have slept together sometimes, but she wasn't sure because it happened when she was blackout. So, like, sure, she babe, doesn't sure. remember because she was too drunk. But, like, it's not out of the question by any means. She also said that Vince knew about Jared. Like, bitch, how dumb do you think these cops are that they're actually going to believe this? Right. He knew like, about Jared? Really? Like, on... What planet are you living on that you think that this story would actually land with police after you've changed your story how many fucking right. times? It's just unfathomable. So Jesse then goes on to say that Jared had worked out a deal for her and Vince to get the drug dealers off of their back. She said so that she was involved with the drug dealers the entire time, right? Because it was going, they were going after her entire family, and she was working desperately to get them off of her back. She was trying to save her family and to save Vince. I hate Bless her. it. She said that Jared brokered this deal with the drug dealers where Jared would set Vince up so that the drug dealers could jump him. The plan was for Jesse to take Vince down this road, right? The road where he was shot. And that's where the drug dealers would beat him up to teach him a lesson. But Jared had promised Jesse that they would only beat Vince up, nothing more. And then after that, they would no longer be in debt to these drug dealers and that their family and them would be safe. Yeah, shooting them nine times is not just teaching them a lesson. That's like a overkill right exactly so jesse said that because she was promised that nothing would happen he was just going to get beat up and this would like end all of their problems that they were having she said that she did what she thought was best for her family and she compl complied with this plan sure bet sure i know you're an ass wipe <laughs> oh shit that was bold i don't know <laughs> if i can say that you said that was bold <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i can say that on here <laughs> This gave police exactly what they needed to arrest not only Jared, but also Jesse. Since his murder was committed in Kentucky, Jesse could also be tried for his murder because being an accomplice to murder and committing the murder are the exact same thing in the eyes of Kentucky court. Thank God. Seriously. As it should be everywhere. Yeah. Well, I don't know. There's some instances where, like, it bothers me when it's like a, like a, like a getaway driver and then the person who's like doing a robbery goes rogue and kills someone or someone has a heart attack inside you know during it and then they're all charged with murder that's a little hard to swallow i feel bad they should be punished but anyways okay we be like i'm not your it. uber yeah we should not get into the semantics of the legal <laughs> system at this moment <clears throat> once they um the two are arrested the truth finally comes out the whole drug dealer story completely was made up by jesse and jared to throw the police off of their scent Long story short, the two assholes wanted to be together and Vince stood in the middle of that dream. Also, Jesse would get a handsome life insurance policy payout if Vince died. This seems like an open and shut case, right? They had Jesse's interview with military police where she put herself at the scene of the crime saying she was the one that lured Vince there and spoke to Jared's involvement in the whole thing. So you would think that they would both. Right. Like, they're both. Got it. Sweet. Close the book. Let's move on. However, when they got to court, the judge threw out Jesse's interview with military police. And so, how? You're probably wondering. Oh, this made me so livid when I was researching this. So, here's the kicker, guys. The day before speaking to military police, she spoke with local police, remember? Mm -hmm. Where she told them she didn't want to speak anymore and that she wanted a lawyer. <gasps> so, legally, no! I know. So, legally, the local police had to stop questioning her, which they did. 
However, a few days later, she was questioned by the military police, which is just, in the court's eyes, another police agency. So according to the judge, the military police should have never questioned Jesse, and anything that she said during that interview was inadmissible. How you, fucked is that? Are, are you kidding me? I know. I know. So then, to make matters even worse, the judge then allowed Jared and Jesse to be to be released on house arrest. No. Yeah. That. Yes. <laughs> That's right. These That's two- what they want. They want to be house arrest. Are they together? No. Oh, okay. I was about to say. That's exactly what they wanted. No. To be house arrest together. Well, you know what? Actually, I don't know if I can say that confidently. I don't know if they were. But I don't think that they were dwelling in the same house legally at that time. And I think you have to be released. To- Surely they did not allow that. I don't know, though. This judge is on something. So. So we. That's. We don't know if we're right. certain. Yeah. That's a good question, though. Um, now, when I'm editing this, I will research that. And if I find anything, I'll put it in there. If not, we're moving on. Okay. Um, now, the prosecution, they immediately filed an appeal against this ruling, as as they fucking yeah. should. Um, however, it would take four fucking years for them, the appeals court, to review the case and come to a verdict. Now... I think my blood pressure is high. Everyone's blood right. pressure is high. So we're right. about to bring it down. So just so you know, the appeals court does overturn the ruling and Jesse's confession is now admissible. Perfect. Thank you. Snaps for, for the appeal court, even though it took you four years. So with her options limited at this point, Jesse decided to take a deal and testify against Jared. Under this deal, Jesse would have to plead guilty and tell the court exactly how Jared and her plan, Jared and her had planned Vince's murder. Now, at this point, Jared knows he's fucked. Like, he knows if Jesse's turning against him, like, right. she's about to tell him everything. Like, he he gets it, right? Um, so he also agrees to a plea deal. So, again, long story, kind of not that short, but whatever. Jesse was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison, and Jared was sentenced to 30 years. Erica, final thoughts on these douche canoes? These are the dumbest Romeo and Juliet like <laughs> story I've ever heard. Yes, it is. Like how they thought they were going to be able to get away with this. I have no They'll idea. Live out and their perfect life happily ever after without the drug dealers on their case. Even though they didn't even try to hide their affair hardly. No. At all before. But they did plan this out for a while because remember she had told neighbors like weeks before Vince's murder about the drug dealer. Right. The fake drug dealing story. Right. Ugh, I hate them. But luckily, to your point, they're fucking idiots, and they got caught, and they These are These two jail. deserve each other and deserve what they got. They deserve to be in jail for a lot longer. Honestly, 22 years doesn't seem like that long. To and me, when, did the, when, when I think did the she murder happen? It was, uh, she's going to be out in our lifetime for sure. Early 2012. She'll be out in our lifetime. Yeah. Like, because she was only, I think she was 25 so in 10 years. at the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's fucking ridiculous. Asshole. I know. And she, like, the, she, this was, they had planned this shit. Not Poorly, this. mind you, thankfully. But, like, they it's planned It's still premeditated. Exactly. So, like, that Thank should you. get a <laughs> That's the word I was looking for. harsher sentence than exactly. 22 years. It's because, they, it's because they made a plea deal. Our justice system is so fucked up. Yeah. That you can do that. And honestly, like, it's surprising to me that they made a plea deal with Jesse, but there was only circumstantial evidence against her. Right. Like, there wasn't anything else, right? Concrete. Because, because Jared did not turn in against Jesse. And so, I, but well, I think she was could, the mastermind. How could, I mean, if she was the mastermind, but ultimately he killed Vince. Right, right. Right, but in Kentucky's like in the eyes of Kentucky court, it doesn't matter, and so maybe right. he could have gotten a better deal if he. I mean, he would have had to admit that he killed her True. or him, excuse me. But yeah, I don't know. It's fucked up. These two fucktards are exactly where they, they belong. belong. Yeah, it's really not fair to Vince, his family, his five kids. No, who lost like their well, two of them lost their mother and their, or excuse me, two three of them lost their mother and their father. Right. You know, two lost their father. It's bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. But anyways, with that being said, guys, be a, be bitch, a bitch and stay alive. alive. Cheers. Cheers.